Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, good evening, wherever you may be. Uh, thank you for joining us here at the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. Uh, we're very excited today to have a panel looking at uh, science fiction, the lessons of it, how it can be applied to uh, strategic and policy thought. And while uh, I myself, Dan Mahaffey, our Senior Vice President, Director of Policy, uh, am here to welcoming uh, everyone to this. Uh, and on behalf of our leadership uh, who are traveling, uh, yes, traveling has resumed, but unfortunately, uh, so too have travel disruptions. Uh, so uh, on their behalf, I'm happy to welcome our, our panel here for this great discussion uh, to boldly go. Uh, these lessons from science fiction, you can apply them. You look at H.G. Wells to Starship Troopers, uh, Star Wars to Star Trek, so many great lessons to learn from and experts to uh, discuss us this here. Um, first, I'm going to go just kind of in the way I see them on my Zoom, so no particular order. Uh, Kira Rolson is a uh, senior Air Force officer, strategist, and B-52 aviator. Uh, she's written extensively, uh, including some of her own science fiction work, uh, but holds graduate degrees as well in intelligence, uh, military operations, and military strategy. Uh, Major General Mick Ryan next is a Australian Army officer. He has commanded uh, tactical units at the Troop Squadron, Regiment, Task Force, Task Force and Brigade levels, a uh, veteran of East Timor, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and served on a Pakistan-Afghanistan coordination cell on the U.S. Joint Staff. Um, Next, uh, Dr. Uh, Margarita Kunev, a research fellow at the Georgetown Center for Security and Emerging Technology, uh, Go Hoyas. She is a, uh, specializes in the military applications of AI, Russian military innovation, and urban warfare. Uh, Stephen Leonard, uh, most of you probably know him as the creative force behind Doctrine Man, uh, but he is also a uh, award-winning faculty member at the University of Kansas. Uh, chairing graduate programs in organizational leadership and supply chain management, uh, as well as a writer who has uh, dedicated his career to building uh, generations of leaders. Uh, and then certainly last uh, but not least, uh, Dr. Kathleen McInnes uh, has worked extensively on both sides of the Atlantic uh, for the Pentagon, the British Parliament, uh, and earned her PhD at uh, War Studies at King's College London. So uh, another alumnus of that on the panel here. Um, so that I, I want to remind folks too that the uh, folks here, they're coming, they're sharing their expertise and thoughts. They're doing so in their own personal capacity, not representing their organizations uh, in any way. So just keep that in mind. It's a way we can have a very uh, free flowing and fruitful discussion here. Um, and now Joshua, I will turn it over to you to demonstrate the power of a fully armed and operational book panel. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, I cannot express how excited I am to have assembled this panel uh, today. Uh, we were talking before the, the, the room opened up about the, if you had the chance to invite folks to dinner or drinks, who would you invite and why? And I could think of no better group of people that I would want to sit down with and have a drink and talk about national security, leadership, foreign policy, any number of topics, but these, four, these five folks here today. Uh, we're here to talk about this amazing book, To Boldly Go. Uh, I got a very early copy of it. I'm incredibly excited about it because uh, it bridges the worlds and universes of science fiction, leadership, national security. And it's one of those books that I love because every single chapter, I always look at it and I was like, huh, I didn't think of it that way. Or that's a really interesting point. And it's so enjoyable to have that. Uh, so what I want to do is open up with uh, kind of getting the nuts and bolts of the book and then giving a chance for each of the uh, essayists to sort of present their own uh, topics. And then we're gonna kind of go into an open discussion. Uh, throughout the conversation, if you come up across any uh, ideas or questions that you may have, please go ahead and enter into the Q&A function at the bottom. And I'll make sure we get to that as we go throughout the dialogue. Uh, so this is, I'm super excited if you couldn't tell, um, but I really wanna open up with uh, Stephen first. Um, I noticed you have Rocket Raccoon in the background, which I didn't notice before, and that's really cool. But how did this book come about? You know, what made you decide to write it? And then how did you assemble you know, an adventure style team of such impressive authors? So I'd be remiss if I didn't give uh, Mick at least partial credit for this because literally the, the idea of putting this book together came together during a dinner at West Point uh, in 2018. We were sharing a title. We just finished uh, our 
contributions to um, uh, Winning Westeros, which was a book that focused in on similar subjects, but in the, in the Game of Thrones universe. And, and, and Mick brought up the idea that, you know, we ought to do something that just kind of widens the aperture so we can look at science fiction more broadly. Uh, and we had gone into that book with, uh, I had made the recommendation that we do exactly what we're doing now that we focus on science fiction a little more broadly uh, so we could open up uh, the audience to more people, more people that were interested, more people that could write. Um, we went a different direction, but we never lost that idea. So when Mick brought it up, then it was just a matter of letting the idea percolate for a while. Um, and we did, and we floated it uh, to a single publisher, which said yes on uh on a first email with a draft proposal, hey, we've got this idea. And it was a it was a yes on the first email, which was surprising because I've since learned that not uh, that's not the standard experience that most people have. Uh, and then it became a matter of, you know, how do you assemble the dream team? Uh, and this is absolutely is a dream team. And what you said about who would I most like to have dinner with or drinks with, that's how that started. I, you know, it, it was, Two, two, the, the, collusion, the, co the collision of two universes. One is the people that I'd like to have dinner or drinks with, and two, who actually read, watch, or follow science fiction in some respect. And that can get to be a weird conversation with people, honestly. You know, hey, are you into science fiction? And they hang up on you. I mean, I, I think Rita almost did that. And I had, I had to pester her a little bit to do this, but given what she, given what she does at Georgetown, she was perfect. It was just, hey, let's do, let's do this. And, and others kind of fell in place. Um, others were people I knew, like, like Kathleen, or you know, people I'd written with, like Kira, uh, just people that, you know, that you're familiar with that have a similar passion or, or at least uh, enjoy the, the genre. And, and then, so then the next gets your dream team. And then the fun part of it, honestly, is, you get as wide a swath of people as possible. So the idea is like you said, you will go from each chapter and go, huh, I never thought about that. And that's the beauty of the anthology is you get a lot more voices with a lot more opinions and perspectives than you would otherwise. And, and I think that just makes for a great experience uh, and, and a great product. Uh, I'm jealous because you have a copy of the book and I don't think anybody else here has a copy yet. Uh, you know, it's, it's like waiting for something that you buy on Kickstarter that doesn't show up for two and a half years. Um, uh, so, you know, I'm extremely jealous and I hope you got the copy with the one mistake that my editor just uh, emailed me about. So at least I'll have, you know, some, some measure of justice in the back of my mind to, hey, you got the one that had a mistake in it. So if so. Oh, I think that just means that my copy is now that much rarer and that much more <laughs> valuable uh, is what I'm hearing on that one. Um, it's, it's incredibly exciting. And I really want to, I want to pivot to, to General Ryan first, if I may, uh, because in your introduction, you talk about the, the role of science fiction and its emergence in professional military education. Um, and I really kind of want to touch upon that because it seems that there's a, a center of mass or an inertia behind it as of late, you know, perhaps it's because of social media, because it's of the popularity of uh, science fiction, even in today, where it's become almost the norm, whereas at one point it was sort of restricted to uh, smaller communities. And I'm curious if you can talk about the role of science fiction and professional military education, how you see it, and then where we can kind of go from there going forward. Yeah, sure. I, I, there's actually a, a deep history of military people using science fiction um, all the way back to the very first military science fiction with the Battle of Dorking in 1870. But it's more recent, recent manifestation, you know, the, the Canadians started with Battle of Zenra, uh, even before 9-11. Uh, uh, and in the last decade or so, you've seen um, the Marines, seen the US Air Force, um, the French Army. Um, and I know we have taken up science fiction as a way to um, think about the future in a way that doesn't um, threaten traditional organisations like normal planning might, but it's also a wonderful way to uh, nurture and harness the creativity that I think is uh, in a lot of our military people that traditional military hierarchies don't always um, elicit from our people or, or encourage 
or incentivize. So, you know, I think it's an idea that's time has come. You've seen this in things like the art of the future, uh, the destination unknown volumes from the United States Marine Corps, which are illustrated science fiction stories that we participated in as well. Um, and, you know, I, I just think it has a place amongst the other ways of thinking and the other um, genres, whether it's military history or IR and other things, to really get into the meat and veggies of what is the future of our profession, what's the future of military activities, but also what's the future of national security endeavours more broadly. And it's very interesting that you bring that point up because uh, I want to turn to Kira. So much of what I think people think of science fiction is, you know, the big star battles, the star cruisers, the Death Stars, all that fun stuff, which we all know and love. You know, we can talk about the TIE fighters and TIE bombers, but at the core of it is very much their stories of people and aliens or anthropomorphic aliens and leadership and teams. And your essay very much brings a lot of that out. And that was one of the first ones that I turned to when I was going through and kind of jumping around in my reading. And I really would love for you to kind of explore that, that deeply personal team component and how you build uh, that kind of inclusive environment to leverage everything to make an organization successful. Well, great. So I think one of the, um, one of the important things that I like to hit with my chapter is um, kind of as, as a little bit discussed before, when it comes to science fiction, using that as a lens, um, and I think General Ryan hit on it. There are a lot of things that I can get into by describing it with science fiction um, that I might not be able to have in an open conversation. So um, the premise behind mine, yeah, I, I tease the X-Wings and the Y-Wings and I tease that out on, on social media a lot too because it generates great discussion. But what it also generates is in this, I can talk about how I wanna be able to build uh, a rebel alliance and I don't have a lot of people to pull from. I have to build my team from what I've got. And so I understand with that, that with limited capacity, I have to be able to open it up a lot of different ways, open it up broadly. Um, and I can really start talking to you about, hey man, it's a shame Chewbacca is one of the greatest shots in the entire Star Wars universe, but he's too big to fit in an X-Wing. I mean, a Wookiee just doesn't fit and they didn't have Wookiees in mind when they built it, right? Um, but I can have that conversation with somebody because it's it's science fiction. We can get into a really nitty gritty discussion on how do I build this team that includes diverse mindsets and body types and ideas. And I can build not only a rebel alliance, but a successful rebel alliance. So we can have that conversation and it doesn't bring up the mental roadblocks and red flags. However, if I start my conversation with, hey, I'd like to talk about diversity, uh, equity and inclusion, there are some people out there that their brain immediately turns off that conversation. Um, so that's what I really liked about this, this chapter is that I am advocating a position that um, diversity, inclusion, and equity within the United States military and other militaries and pretty much all organizations is good and it helps the organizations, it helps corporations, it helps any team that you are trying to build when you can bring in those diverse mindsets and diverse backgrounds and um, diversity of thought. Um, but because we use sci-fi, we can actually have that conversation without some of those mental roadblocks coming up. I really enjoyed the, especially in your essay, the, the back and forth nature of the, the letter from Leia Organa to Poe Dameron and kind of how that was a vehicle, almost a, a Socratic method of sorts to explain kind of that very much that theme and topic you were talking about. And, and staying in the Star Wars universe, I wanna to turn to, to Farida for a second, because uh, you write about the role of artificial intelligence and robotic assistance and uh, just how accepted they are in those universes. And at the same time, we have a, a sort of, uh, a binary approach and understanding to AI and robotics, where it's either you know, C-3PO and R2-D2 and they're wonderful, or it's a Terminator and they're coming to kill us. Um, so I'm curious, and you write about sort of trust and asymmetry in artificial intelligence and robotics. I'm curious how that manifests in the science fiction universe and kind of where you went with it with that essay. Sure. So like, you know, like C started when he first came to me with this idea to write about science fiction and national security or military consequences and applications, things we can learn from the science fiction universe. I was a little hesitant more than a little because that's not necessarily a universe I reside in quite often. But the more I thought about it, um, what really ended up convincing me to, you know, give this a try was two things. First of all, is that, you know, having gone through 
the PhD, I think I've become a little bit of a joy killer because every time somebody has a really great, cool idea, my first question is uh, like, so how are you going to measure it? How are you going to operationalize it? And that is just like, come on. You know, people want to get creative. People want to think big thoughts. And the minute that you start trying to bring them down back to reality, you lose like just exactly like what Kira said, you lose a lot of the audience with you. And the second point is that in essence, science fiction is about relationships. So in any movie that you can think about, in any book you can think about, there is a relationship. There is an, an an essential relationship and it sometimes can be between humans and machines, aliens and humans. So there is still very much a person, a human at the core of that relationship, but it is vis-a-vis -vis some other being that is different from us in one way or another. And the research that I've been doing before that focused on understanding the role of trust in human machine teams as the US military and other militaries obviously begin to adopt um, you know, more applications of autonomous machines and uh, AI in military operations. And trust is obviously central to make all of that work. And I started thinking that actually when we look into the relationship it is built, it is built on asymmetry. Like asymmetry is, a, it's the defining feature of that relationship. And the minute that asymmetry is gone, whether because that machine becomes sentient or becomes, I don't know, there's some sort of a bug in it that makes it behave the way that it wants, in a way that undermines that asymmetry, it undermines trust. And one way or another, it leads to some sort of a disaster. And it made me really think about like, what are the implications? What does this mean for the way that the US military is going forward? As we are investing greater resources and more thought and more experimentation into more and more advanced machines, we are trying to essentially append that asymmetry. So that made me a little worried because that asymmetry is contingent for the relationship to work. And the minute that it's gone, one way or another, disaster is impending. So I really enjoyed the process of writing my chapter because it made me think in directions I wouldn't have otherwise, because I didn't necessarily have to operationalize every single aspect of it. And I could really, you know, open my brain to alternative ideas and alternative mental models and ways to think about, you know, this relationship between human and machines and what's important in it and what has to work. So what Kira was saying is that, you know, equity is essential for successful human teams, but that's not correct in the relationship between humans and machines, between, because one way or another humans, and as we learn from science fiction, are subservient. They're there to assist, to help, to execute one way or another, but they are not responsible for defining the scope of the relationship, the scope of the mission or whatnot. So as we are you know, progressing in this effort to make machines smarter, faster, more aware of us and the environment, we risk appending that asymmetry. And then we got to have, have you know, a sober conversation about what that means for the future of human machine teaming. That's absolutely fascinating. And I really like the fact that you pulled about that relationship component. And that's the theme, again, we're kind of coming through all these essays is that that human relationship, that kind of interaction between be the aliens, robots, or you know, the various components of the sci-fi universe. And I want to turn to Kathleen on this one because I think it's a great uh, a segue to your topic where you write it very much about you know, the role of strategic empathy and empathy in relationships, but also understanding our friends and adversaries and with whom we're also working. And I think it's particularly apt as we look at, you know, not to take it too far down to where we are today, you know, the withdrawal from Afghanistan and what's happened. Um, and as we look to Russia and look to China and trying to understand things from their perspective. So I'm just curious if you can explore that component of strategic empathy uh, in your essay and where you see that in the science fiction universes. Sure. Um, so I guess to, to answer the question, I'll sort of start with how I got interested in the question of strategic empathy specifically. Um, I've spent, you know, wrote a novel, I spent a lot of time thinking about story and what story does for us and, and what, how, how it is a, you know, when done right and when used right, 
it's it's this methodologically unbound analytic tool. Like you can explore an entire universe in this in a, in a logically unstructured way and just sort of make all sorts of weird in, in different connections, and then you you know tease out certain insights and then start testing them with with more traditional analytic methods. Um, but one of the things that makes story work or not work is empathy. Empathy makes it resonant, um, and, and you know a story works or doesn't work when people stop turning the page, right? So, so I started thinking, well, like, wh what is it that that we are doing or not doing that is is com comports with principles of story? And it it occurred to me that um, we as a community tend to be very focused on narratives, right? Like, we need to shape the narrative, we need to get ahead of the narrative, all that sort of stuff. But but narrative is is generally talking at people. It is it is the message you want to communicate, but it's not empathetic or resonant story. Um, so so what does that mean? What so 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 then I, I came across this this concept of strategic empathy and started playing around with it. And 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 it started with Sun Tzu, who actually points out that you know in order to to understand your enemy, you, you, you need to understand your enemy, but you also need to understand yourself. And that's one of the key insights that I took away from writing this chapter. Um, on the, the first part, understanding our adversaries um, and our allies, um, it's, it's, much, it's more than just inputs, right? It's not, we have spent so much money on Intel inputs, but um, actually bringing like human understanding and actually like interpreting those inputs is, is where we seem to be lacking and falling down. And there's um, uh, Zachary Shore um, in um, Sense of the Enemy. He's got an idea on um, how you can get into the minds of, of your adversaries. So there's it's some interesting ideas to tease out there, but I think we've got a long way to go. But I centrally, the, one of the hardest tasks as a human is to know yourself, right? And, and, and I think that very much applies to our bureaucracies, our national security bureaucracies. I think we've got some blind spots that we, we don't like to um, confront when we make policy. We, we, we are focused on, on um, what's happening in the interagency um, and not necessarily talking to, communicating, or understanding where, where our partners or even our American public are is on, on a lot of these issues. And so that's, that's so we're creating narratives we're not creating empathy. Um, and that leads to what HR McMaster calls um, strategic narcissism, which if you've got a fundamentally distorted sense of self, um, you are, which a narcissist, like a clinical narcissist has, um, you're going to make bad decisions about the world because you're not capable of empathy. Um, so I thought that was, that was also an interesting insight to sort of bring into it. And so um, in terms of sci-fi, um, I, I, I wanted to use Old Man's War um, because it's awesome. Um, but then I was, I was talking about this project with my husband and he was like, you know, you ought to really look at Ender's Game as well and like um, Speaker for the Dead. And I realized that, you know, those two works, you know, smashed against Sun Tzu. It's almost like a large Hadron Collider of, of ideas and, and just things what happens at, at the end of it. Um, those, those, those two books teased out really nicely what it meant to um, have empathy, not sympathy. Like you, can't, we don't want to sympathize with the Taliban. They throw acid in women's faces. Like the, you know, um, but we do want to have um, cognitive empathy so we can actually understand their mindsets. Um, and and Speaker for the Dead really helps get into what that means. Um, and Old Man's War. I mean, I'd say John Perry is a character who knows himself and is able to make really great strategic decisions. Because he knows himself, and he and he's got a because he knows himself, he's got a clear-eyed view of the colonial union and the adversaries around him. So, um, yeah, that's all. Stop there. It was just a fascinating exercise to to sort of smash these different bits together and see what happened. Um, and and I and I really hope looking forward, um, first we can use better use story um, as an analytic tool and and flesh out as a community what that means. Um, because I, th I think we've got a bit of work to do there. Um, and I really hope we start tackling you know, strategic empathy, not just to understand our adversaries, but to understand ourselves a lot better. You've just touched on a number of different themes that I kind of want to go almost all over the place. Um, so I'm going to kind of have to park a few of them to get back to them. So I apologize. 
um, because that, that empathy component um, speaks very much to the human nature aspect of you know, humans and aliens in the sci-fi universe is writ large, but also on a very granular and you know, tangible issue that we face today. And Stephen, in, in your essays, you very much focus on the, the human nature aspect of the characters, uh, whether it's Planet of the Apes, whether it's the mirror universe in Star Trek. And I'm curious if you can tease out more about that and you know, what do these entries tell us about human nature and exploring those challenges of overcoming, be it the strategic narcissism, overcoming the challenges of you know, building a you know, inclusive representative team, uh, overcoming the challenges of interacting with you know, AI partners and whatnot, and that very key component there. So it's a great question to follow what Kathleen just talked about, because part of, part of what I do every day is, is talk organizational behavior. And, and really, organizational behavior boils down to human nature, why people do what they do, why we make the decisions that we do. And, and empathy is a huge part of that. If you, don't, if you don't take the time to understand yourself, then you'll never understand why you do the things that you do. And, and I will, and I'll be honest that, you know, most of what I do with my students is, okay, let's take the time to peel back the onion and find out why that decision was made. So whether you're talking about why do you withdraw from Afghanistan, you know, at the drop of a hat or, or, or why do you do something, you know, why do you decide to attack a Native American village when you really don't know what's in there? You know, in the, in the example of Custer, it's all human nature. It's all, it's human nature, it's mental models. It's, you know, the, 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 the predilection towards action without being fully informed. Um, and, and those are the, those are themes that obviously carry through in, into the, into the writing that I did but it always has. So, you know, if you look at whether I talk about, uh, you know, I've written extensively on the Battle of the Yadrang Valley, about Little Bighorn, a few other things, truly from a historical perspective, the writing all gets down to human nature. Why do people do what they do? And, and, and really taking the time to understand those people on an individual basis that maybe people aren't, aren't just uh, black and white characters. Maybe there's time to spend in those shades of gray to understand who we are and what we do. Uh, and that just, you know, it, it takes from what Kathleen was just saying. You have to understand yourself. And although I've never read The Old Man's War, it's one of uh, many books that's, you know, on the top of my list now uh, to get to because you are a better leader if you understand who you are. And the better you understand yourself, the more time you take for self-reflection, the better you're going to be at what you do because you're going to recognize your own biases. You're going to be able to work around and through them better. Um, and so it's worth all that. And, and you know, now it's my... You know, probably my go-to when I write, I end up digging into characters. Um, and and I, although I would say the Planet of the Apes, I didn't dig as much into the characters as I wanted to. I spent so much time trying to understand Rod Serling that it completely took over an entire chapter. And that wasn't the intent when I started. I just found him so fascinating. And then how his life experience, life experiences affected that first script for Planet of the Apes, you know, I didn't know that. And, and you find yourself buried, you know, 4,000 words into why he does certain things in that script. And you forget why you started in the first place. And so that's, you know, my weakness there is, you know, I, I am very much a character driven human nature kind of person. I don't want to pivot to Cure on this one, because an essay that's not included in To Boldly Go, but you write about Starbuck from Battlestar Galactica, and why she was a terrible officer and a leader. And I think part of that speaks to what Stephen was talking about, that absence of self-awareness. And I'm curious if you can talk about that and talk about how science fiction more broadly has informed your leadership role as a commander in the Air Force, as an officer, and helped you develop other officers and enlisted personnel. Thanks. That's a great question. So uh, it's interesting. I uh when it comes to using sci-fi to develop leadership, I feel like I got uh, in on the game a little bit late. I didn't read Ender's Game until I was 22. And I consider that part of foundational leadership when it comes to, um, you know, sci-fi, you know, books that I recommend to everybody because it does talk to that empathy, um, you know, at the very end of the book and he's talking about, he finally comes to feel empathy for his main, um, you know, adversary. And in that moment, he understands them and he knows how, how to counter them. Um, and I, there are other parts of that too. So it's very training oriented. And I have read that at various points in my career. I started when I was in nav school, um, 
And, you know, like, it's just, it's just that visceral feeling of, he talks about, he's like chewing on his own hand in his sleep and the terrible nightmares that he has because of everything that's happening to him. Um, and I remember having just nightmares about shooting a Takan in a T6. Um, and so, you know, like it just resonated with me. And as I've read various other science fiction books, it's interesting where it resonates as I go through periods in my life. And so Ender's Game, you know, when I was younger and going through all these training courses, um, that and the leadership lessons there, and then you get into um, things like Dune. And I'm, I'm so excited for the new, new Dune to come out. I want to watch that um, once it's out this fall. Um, but if you, if you read it, um, there's still, you know, there's leadership lessons to learn from that as well. Um, and then you can open it up, obviously, to television and movies and sci-fi. And so I, uh, again, I watched Battlestar Star Galactica during a more formative time in my early career. Um, it didn't parallel exactly the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, but um, there were definitely some points where they were really on the nose, poking the viewer about some of these things. Um, and I remember watching, you see this evolution of the character Starbuck. So uh, Kara Thrace, so of course I, I have some empathy there already for the name. Um, and she starts off, she's this young hotshot pilot uh, or, you know, in my case, navigator. And, uh, you know, I, I saw so many parallels in myself and so, I'm watching the show and how the character evolves and the leadership challenges presented. And it's really interesting because they start her out as a very tactical level leader, uh, a flight lead essentially um, going out and doing very tactical level decisions. And then after an injury, she has to move on to the more operational side and you see her planning. So in the very first season, um, you know, she's your typical maverick character of they allow her to be, um, you know, kind of the, the wild maverick because she's so good at her job at the tactical level. But then as she has to move up into the more operational level, um, you can really see that leadership development as it changes. Um, and so I like using that when I'm talking um, to my younger officers, uh, my mid-level NCOs, and using that as a leadership development tool for them. Because again, if I use it through the lens of sci-fi, that's something that's real and they understand. And so they can, you can cross cut a lot of conversational pieces um, and get right to the heart of the matter. And I think that's a great part about um, using an essay like that is I don't have to give you the 4,000 pages to, or 4,000 words to start with of, you know, building up the, the leadership lessons. I just tell you, hey, do you remember this episode? Do you remember this scene particularly? And boom, it's right there. And you go, okay, here's what's good. Here's what's bad. Let me draw you some parallels to what's going on, you know, in our organization. Um, and now I truncate about 15 minutes off a conversation and we can really get to that um, right away. And so I love Starbuck because it's uh, she's a learning character. She evolves over time. Um, and even with my my younger lieutenants that I'm sort of bringing along, hey, you know, we're this little slap on the wrist right now. But you saw that with her. She developed, she got more mature. Uh, and like many people, um, not everybody was a great leader to begin with, we all have to learn. And so it's great to be able to teach young leaders that even if you make mistakes early on, it's recoverable. Um, and if you kind of temper it down and, and you learn from those mistakes, you can still be the leader that you wanna be. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Battlestar Galactica. Uh, one of the coolest things I've ever been able to do was I had Thanksgiving dinner about 10 years ago with the actor that played Gaius Baltar. Um, who was a best friend of one of my colleagues that I didn't know was coming to Thanksgiving dinner when I was living in London. So to have him show up there, I just completely nerded out to say the least. Uh, but what's, uh, what's really cool about Battlestar Galactica, I think, is there's so much in terms of civil military relations and the role of the military and the political leadership and technology and everything. So I want to turn to uh, General Ryan uh, first, if I may, and then bring uh, Rita in on this one as well is exploring through old, man, old Man's War in particular, the civil military relations, the dynamic there, but then also the components of the artificial intelligence and technology component of Old Man's War and how those two components fit together. Because I think you draw out, uh, General Ryan, some fantastic lessons from Old Man's War. And then uh, Rita, your thoughts on the, the Brain Pal and Perry and how that sort of uh, interaction worked together. I'd love to explore both of those angles. Yeah, I'm, like Kathleen, I'm a massive fan of uh, Old Man's War and, and John Scalzi more broadly. Indeed, we have a, um, I run a science fiction elective at our war college, which is called the Perry Group. Um, and the guessing game when we set it up four years ago was which Perry was it named after? And the smart ones uh, all thought it was after Admiral Perry and these kind of things. But uh, I said, no, no, it's after a character. 
So when we had John Scalzi visit for a sci-fi conference at the college a couple of years ago, we got his own Perry Group coin and he was very excited that we named him. Um, but I, I think civil military relations is a really important contemporary topic because, because I think many of our institutions are still, uh, I guess, founded on Huntingtonian ideals of civil military relations. And as, as a lot of people, particularly in the United States, uh, Risa Brooks and, and others have, have written, I think the, the, his ideas are aging and haven't always aged particularly well. Um, and that there's requirement for more scholarship and, and different theories of the relationship uh, between the military. And I think three elements of, of civil society, firstly, the military and the government. Um, and how do you build people who can act um, effectively in that relationship, particularly senior military leaders. And you know, we're seeing that play out as we speak in the United States. Uh, but also the relationship between the military and civil servants within the government. Um, that, that's a really important part of civil military relations that I think is, that's overlooked. And also the relationship between the military and the society that it serves. And they're, they're three uh, components of civil military relations, all of which I think need new scholarship and, and need to be looked at uh, through the lens of, a, of democratic societies which are better informed than they've ever been and are different, I think, from what they were in the 50s and 60s when Moscovitz and Huntington and others uh, did their, their seminal work. So old man's war, I think, you know, when it takes up old people, when they turn a certain age, uh, brings in uh, characters that are already well steeped in the traditions and, and the ideas of the societies they come from, mainly from the United States for Scalzi's stories. Uh, and they, so they already have a good idea about how people in the military should react to their societies. And what they find with the colonial union is um, it's actually not a very effective civil military relationship. It's everything uh, is military. Every problem has a military solution. Um, and that's one of the things as you go through the books that Perry really struggles with is that everything has a military solution. There's no room for diplomacy. There's no room for uh, economics. There's no room really even for understanding the different adversaries they're coming up against. They're just trying that the whole universe is against them. So just kill them all. Um, so I think there's a lot of important lessons in there for, uh, for military, but also national security practitioners uh, from that uh, old means war series. And, and frankly, towards the end of the series, you see that it's actually not mil a military solution that uh, ends up uh, allowing earth to see that there's this bigger universe out there. It's, it's an economic solution. Um, so I think there's a lot in there. I, you know, I totally on board with what Kathleen was saying about strategic empathy, because you see this in uh, John Perry as well towards the back end of some of the, the novels. Uh, but it really forces us to rethink our own notions in a contemporary world of civil and military relations. And the best science fiction should be tackling contemporary issues, whether it's civil military relations, climate change, um, the militarization of some national endeavors that perhaps best lay in civilian realms. Um, Kathleen, I want to tee you up to follow on um, after uh, Rita's where you can explore the, the components of the artificial intelligence technology, because I want to follow on the civil military relations aspect. Uh, so Rita, you write about an old man's war, that interaction, again, that trust and asymmetry and almost a successor to Elon Musk's Neuralink becoming the brain pal, uh, which is a little alarming, especially if they start broadcasting uh, ads into our brains. Um, I'm curious, that seems to be such uh, a prevalent and very near term potential reality, um, which a lot of the topics that are discussed into boldly go are you know, in a galaxy far, far away or in the far, far future, whereas artificial intelligence, machine learning, it's here and now. Uh, so I'm curious you know, how you explore the relevance and permanence and timeliness of these issues and through old man's war and going forward. Okay, so I will admit to only having read the first book out of the series. I started the second one and, you know, life happened. Uh, but I really did enjoy the first one a lot. And just, you know, beyond the themes that everyone's mentioned, it's a phenomenal book, but it also really makes you think about aging and just who is valuable and disposable in the population and at what time of their lives they matter and to whom <laughs> and for what purposes. So on this AI point though, in th my chapter where I referenced uh, Old Man's War was when discussing uh, human machine interaction and even the 
you know, the following stage uh, of like human machine integration. And what they, in the old man's war, they have this thing called the brain, pan, uh, uh, brain pal, right? So it's an AI that is directly inserted into the brain and then it integrates with the human brain and essentially learns from, uh, you know, the officer's uh, brain functions, it learns to anticipate what they want, where do they want to go, how do they want to communicate, uh, where do they want to navigate and whatnot. What is interesting about it is like in the first stages when they are just uh, being inserted with this technology is they don't they don't trust it. They hate it. They all like the, uh, they're supposed to name this thing and they all give it like curse words names that, you know, we're not going to repeat in polite society. But it is indicative of like they feel like this is an alien thing being inserted into their body. And I think one of the like the the research right now on this like neural augmentation technology aside of, you know, with all due respect to Elon Musk, like it is very at its very, very rudimentary stages. And I think there's going to be significant societal resistance to it being like available at a mass scale. I think it might be available in situations where people need, you know, physiological help and as part of like medical interventions or whatnot, but for it to become fully widespread, I think there's gonna be questions of insurance, questions of functionalities. I think it's like almost like autonomous cars. On the one hand, it seems like we're gonna have them tomorrow. On the other hand, we thought we're gonna have them tomorrow 20 years ago. So there's like, there's a lot of like societal uh, broader barriers to it. So I, I think what I'm trying to say is that on the one hand, it seems that, and it's true to in many ways, AI is already here. AI is on our phone. AI is in, you know, is being integrated into military operations and systems. Uh, it's everywhere in the commercial space. But at the same time, I think we anticipated to have this immediate revolutionary impact. And that's just not the reality of the technology and it's not the reality of society that does not change as rapidly and as quickly as we anticipated to do so. Uh, and the resistance that they feel goes away with time but it also goes away with time because the technology continuously proves itself to be reliable. And that's something that the technology that we currently have right now has not done. And we actually tend to punish uh, technological mistakes much more than we tend to punish uh, you know, people making mistakes. And you can see that the minute that there were accidents uh, and deaths that were caused by, uh, you know, the early models of autonomous cars experimentations, they were taken off the road. And at the same time, how many people caused car accidents and then continue to drive. So I think there is a lot of, you know, broader societal barriers that are going to kind of pause on a lot of these significantly more advanced technologies that we're seeing in science fictions and learning from it. But on the one hand, who knows, maybe we will have self autonomous self-driving cars, you know, while we're still young. That's a little alarming given the way that people drive in the DMV area, maybe an improvement or uh, a detriment, who knows. <laughs> um, uh, Kathleen, I want to pivot over to you and then also uh, pull in uh, Stephen as well on, on the civil military uh, interaction question. And particularly with Kathleen, uh, I'm ashamed to say it took me far too long to pick up your book, which is absolutely fantastic. So I apologize for that on my behalf. I'm curious, you know, having participated in this program, uh, having interacted with these other experts, you know, what lessons you would want to pull in if you had to pick three, for example, going back into the Pentagon and saying, hey, these are the three key civil military relations or leadership lessons you would want to have your colleagues pick up on, uh, either from your own research, from this book, or from the universe uh, more broadly. And then, Stephen, you close the book with a really interesting exploration on sort of leadership and toxic leadership and how impactful that can be. Um, and I kind of want to explore those two components kind of hand in hand if we can. Um, sure, um, so I think if I were going back into uh, Pentagon land, um, I would frame it in terms of questions that I would like to see teased out a lot more effectively. Um, uh, the first um, on, on Civ Mill, really, actually no, I'm gonna go with Heart of War first. What, what did Heart of War teach me? Um, um, so wrote this novel, Devil Wears Prada set in the Pentagon, young woman sort of entering as an action officer, figuring out what the, the, the weird wild world of the Pentagon is like. And um, 
that became very much a reflection on whether the systems that we have designed as, as a national security enterprise, that the systems we operate within, are we really setting ourselves up, our people up for failure, right? Do we have um, institutions, cultures, processes that, that don't allow our people to speak up, don't feel um, able to be included, um, or, you know, and don't make people feel like the work they are doing is valued. And um, I think that there's some very serious organizational design and organizational cultural problems that the Pentagon has that is, and the national security enterprise has that are systemic in nature and, and that we really need to, 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 um, to, to tackle. We don't like to talk about human resources kinds of stuff that much. It's like, we'd rather talk about the enemy. We'd rather talk about China and the rise or strategic competition or what widget we need to be able to defeat China. We need to actually talk about our people and whether we're setting them up for success. Um, because if we do not have the right people in, in a culture and within systems that allows them to actively participate and feel empowered to put the, their best policy positions or ideas forward, we will not, there's no way we will be able to counter China. There's no way. We, we need the best people to be able to contribute their best ideas. If we get that solved, I have every confidence that we will be able to manage these major geostrategic challenges. But I'm not convinced that we're there on, on, um, on, on, on having that culture that we need to be able to do so. Um, in terms of civ mill relations specifically, um, Secretary Austin in his confirmation hearing, um, when he was, he was speaking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and he had this great phrase that you can never take your hand off the wheel when it comes to DEI matters. And I think that also applies to civilian military relations. Um, I, I, I completely agree with uh, General Ryan that there is, there are shifts in the, the national and international conversations on, on civilian military relations that are really important. But the one that I'm focusing on the most these days, in part related to what I just said, um, is what is the role of a civil servant professionally, ethically, morally within this construct? Um, we don't pay attention to that. We, we talk a lot about what um, the military's roles and responsibilities and ethics are as a profession, and that's extremely important, but what are the commensurate roles, ethics, responsibilities on the civilian side? We just sort of throw people in and, and see what happens, and I don't think that is, that, that, that's, that's not right <laughs> and on so many levels, and so I think we really need to start thinking about what what it does it mean to be a national security civil servant professional and 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 tease that out as a community um so that's those are the things that i would take in the thing uh, Stephen, building off of that because i think uh, kathleen raised a really interesting point and i kind of want to bring it back to the star wars universe if i may um it, looking at the empire we're talking about leadership and you have a model in the empire that's very authoritarian in terms of the styles of leadership and in your essay when you start talking about toxic leadership it was the empire doomed to fail and what would what should they have done to empower their teams to be successful oh that's a that's a complicated question um first i want to i want to point out that when you asked a question about how we built the team one of the things i tried to do is find people like kathleen who talked with their hands as much as you and i do so so when we came to this point that i wouldn't feel like the odd man out the only one who waves his hands around when he speaks and, and I'm, I'm just thankful that she's here and that you're here. There we go. Um, so this was actually, this is actually a topic that, that covers both sides of, it, it covers uh, the Jedi really well as, it, as much as it does um, the Empire. And it was something that I wrote about in a previous book, uh, the whole idea that uh, it gets to that, uh, the, the civ military uh, interaction, again, what, what Mick talked about too, the idea that with the Jedi, for example, that you have to have an inherent connection to the society that you're tasked with serving and defending. And if you don't have that question, that or don't have that connection, that starts to that starts to build in, um, uh, it starts to break that associative link and, and it calls into question an ethical issue because at, at a certain point when you're no longer connected to that society, are you a mercenary? What are you? Uh, because that, that societal connection is what, you know, that, what underpins your values. Um, so then you, you switch over to the empire. Um, 
uh, yeah, I mean, it's nice to be able to say that were they doomed to fail? I, I don't know. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Uh, yes, an authoritarian uh, regime. Uh, yes, one that, uh, that did everything in a, in a, in a value uh, vacuum, a values vacuum, I guess you could say. But, but it also gets to what I was saying earlier that there's a lot of gray space there to explore. And I think it's that gray space where you find, let's say the interaction between father and son uh, in the Star Wars movies where, hey, there's still some good left in Darth Vader. You just got to look for it. Yeah, you're not going to find that in Palpatine. You're probably not going to find that in Snoke. But you know, it's, a, it's that idea that there's, there's a lot of gray space to explore. So I don't think anything is a fait accompli in that, in that sense that you know, a good writer, somebody who develops the good narrative, Kathleen, that um, will find that and tease all that through. So the answers are in the gray space, not on the extremes of good and bad, which where most audiences tend to fall. It's that those answers, the resolution is, is in the gray space where you take the time to understand the character and the nuances of how they think and how they, how they function, but that's where your answers are. Um, and it's the same thing when you talk about toxic leadership in that final chapter. There's, there are shades of gray and there are shades of black. And, and it's something that I like to talk about when I uh, discuss this in, in leadership classes is that we'll, we'll spend two or three weeks talking about the complexities of toxic leaders. And not everybody's toxic. Some are incompetent, but we kind of lump them in there with everybody else. Uh, some just aren't capable of making decisions. And so they run organizations off the rails. And, and I teach my students, you, you have to take the time to understand who they are, what their motivations are, why they make the decisions that they do, because at the end of the day, you have to be able to interact with them, toxic or not. Uh, and, and, you, and you can't interact with people if you don't understand them. Um, and so it kind of gets to what everybody said today, that you know, there's, you finish off that with that, the book with that chapter, but that's the, the reminder that there are shades of gray and we need to take the time to explore them. I want to pivot to some, some big picture, broad questions. And there I go using my hands again um, to kind of bring everybody in because th this conversation has been so fantastic. And I would love once the kind of world returns to some semblance of normal to kind of convene everybody, get a couple of pints on a table and just have some pizza and a conversation and just record this because this conversation has been fantastic uh, and there's so much more to go through. Um, taking a pivot and kind of where we stand today, you know, if you had to give President Biden, uh, General Milley, you know, one episode, one film uh, to watch or even one book and one story to read, uh, what would that be and why? You know, from the science fiction universes that you've explored, and I know that's a very challenging question, um, because I, I see Kira sitting there you know, deeply looking at thought, like, ah, oh, dang, that's a good one. Um, you know, anybody can jump in first. You know, what would be that episode? What would be that story? What would be that movie and why? Um, I'll, I'll jump in because I got one straight away. Um, the Forever War by Jay Halderman, uh, because it, it gets at issues, of, the strategic issues of why we go to war, uh, why we finish war, um, strategic empathy for, for an adversary or, or someone we think is an adversary. But it also gets into the relationship between the military and the society it serves over long periods of time, and also the veteran's journey, right? The, the journey from civilian to soldier and back again. And they're all really important themes for strategic leaders and political leaders, I think. And uh, it's, it's one of the two books we make our Perry Group read for those reasons. Kara, Rita, Stephen? Kathleen? Having problems thinking of like narrowing it to just one. <laughs> you know, um, right now, um, so I, I'm late to this, this particular game, but um, uh, Three Body Problem is one that I picked up recently. Um, and I find that really interesting, again, from this lens of strategic empathy. Um, th there's, there's this this question of how humanity can begin to hate itself that I th and, and, and therefore create all sorts of um, major strategic and intergalactic problems as a result of that, that um, misanthropy that, that I think like in, in a world of, of climate change and 
um, transnational challenges and um, you know the uh, global trends, the, the National Intelligence Council's Global Trends 2035 report. Um, one of the things that it's, it states as, as a major trend is that governments are are increasingly going to be unable to meet the expectations of of those that are governed, right? And so, as that expectations and reality mismatch widens, um, how do people interpret, view? understand their their governments as well as humanity itself um and do we do we do we descend into pessimism um so from that perspective um I'm, i've been i've been noodling on three body problem quite a lot i can give it a go but i wouldn't say this is necessarily the the thing but i think about minority report a lot and not necessarily just the predictive policing aspect of it which is i mean an obvious uh insight but i think about it from the from the perspective of technology or some sort of a capability that enables us to create a perfect world and i think there's a lot of tech optimism in american society that is driven by the you know the incredibly successful and accomplished technology sector here. But I think there's a tendency from that technology sector to overestimate the positive impact that those technological developments can make and underestimate the negative impact that they can make. I mean, who in 2004, when we were signing up for Facebook to post pictures of our friends, would have thought that it would be the thing that it is today. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that I is that I get out of it is the concept of if we only knew. And not only I feel like we have this conversation of like if people only knew what was happening, we could fix it. We could solve it. If people only knew the horrible situation in country X then we would intervene and we would help. And I think that we now live in a world that we know a lot. And we need to understand that information does not necessarily equate to action or right or wrong. Sometimes information just exists and people don't do anything. And sometimes people don't necessarily have to do anything about it. So trying to kind of disambiguate these big issues of technology, the type of capabilities that it gives us or doesn't give us, and the idea of having information about everything is the solution to world problems. I think that's an excellent point. And I I like what you brought up with that, um, you know, because we always talk about it's a uh, you know, like it's always an intelligence failure. Is it a is it a tactical win or is it an intelligence failure? And General Milley just this week said it was a logistical win and a strategic failure, right? Like it was the first time I've ever seen somebody not blame intelligence as the reason for a failure. And so that just that struck me. And I really hope that the academic community and the the mill and, and civ community really get together and explore that issue for it not being an intelligence failure for once. Um, if I had to pick one book, I think I'd, I'd have to go back to Ender's Game. Part of that, again, the empathy portion, um, understand yourself, understand your enemy. But I would also point it out as throughout this course of that story, the idea is that, you know, we have this child hero, he comes in and he's the leader and savior of the military, but that never happens. That's never reality. It is absolutely fiction. It can never be one single leader. We have to go across all of military, civilian, um, and, and, you know, the military industrial complex to get everything together to be able to win a war. And so um, I would point it out really, it's just the, hey, this is pure fiction. It's great to read about, but will never happen in reality. And I would just like to add, because I know we're getting short on time, that I was always an Asimov fan growing up and, and the robot novels of Asimov were, were absolutely phenomenal. And as much because you not only had the opportunity to explore the ideas of technology and human interaction technology, but the ethics of that at the same time. And then that's something that I think we need to have a, a broader discussion of writ large, 
that uh, the ethics that, that underpin our advancements in AI and how we intend to work that in the future and how much of a priority is it Rather, you know, the As Asimov dealt with it one way, and then the Terminator dealt with it another way. The Terminator films, and, and they're and they're polar opposites. But it's you know, Asimov put a lot of thought into this long before we were where we are today, and and how we would evolve to that point, and what role technology uh, would take in our society, and how society would would deal with that, contend with that. And you know, if you ever if you saw the movie I Robot, that was as much about human relationships, uh, uh, human biases, as it was about the advancement of technology. We're getting kind of short on time, and I have uh, two questions: one from the audience that I want to pick up on, and one that I have on my massive two-page list of questions. Um, and it's kind of a, a villain and a hero question. So on the one hand, uh, Ethan, who is our uh, senior fellow at the center, is asking. You know, which sci-fi villain has the most to teach us about leadership and strategic thinking? So the villain side of the question, and then flipping it, making this more complicated for you, it, who is the best Star Trek captain of the Star Trek universes that you know, we are aware of? You know, is it Kirk? Is it Picard? Is it Janeway? Is it Cisco? Uh, so good and bad to close with villain and hero. I want to jump on the villain piece because uh, I think we tried to make this point that Khan is the villain, even more than Darth Vader. Khan is the villain of science fiction. Everybody knows who Khan. Everybody yells Khan when they hear his name. Uh, he was the prototype for the bad guy, but again, it's a shade of gray bad guy because he wasn't always the bad guy. It was he was shaped by experiences, by you know development uh, to become who he was. And I think that was something that John Klug tried to dig into in his chapter is that there's an entire, uh, I don't want to say a universe, but a much deeper lore on Khan that deals with SETI Alpha 5, the death of his wife, the collapse of the colony, all that that leads from uh, Space Seed into the wrath of Khan that just makes it all the more fascinating. I'll, I'll, jump, I'll jump in on villain too because it just occurred to me like one of the the worst villains that I can think of is Baron Harkonnen in, from Dune right he's horrible but then you sort of think about but but also that universe is pretty horrible <laughs> like it's a terrible terrible place to live and so you wonder to what extent um he's just is it nature or nurture uh that that is the the the, the driver for his like just grossness um yeah I'll jump on the hero portion of this. So Star Trek captains, hands down, Jean-Luc Picard will be always be my captain. Um, but I think that the thing I really like about him, he is level-headed, um, a passionate man, but all of his decisions seem to be founded in reason. Um, and it comes down to that one pivotal scene, right? Like it's the absolutely, I will stick to reason and what I believe and understand. There are four lights right like and it comes down to um do you go with what is ethical reasonable or you or do you to bow to the whim of no just say the wrong answer and the, the pain will be over uh and i think that's just you know of of that star trek portion of the star trek universe that is just the most pivotal scene for me in seeing him as the captain and the leader at the risk of aging myself, I will admit freely, I grew up watching the original series. And I actually had a gold t-shirt that I wore to class in second grade. And I had my mom do the little Starfleet emblem. And there was never any other captain uh, than, than James Kirk. And as silly as that may be in retrospect, uh, I could actually do a pretty good impression of him right now and I won't. But there was only one captain. Everybody else that followed was good, but you know, I was stuck with Kirk, you know, from the from the time I had that. And I would be lying if I said I still didn't have a Star Trek t-shirt in my closet. So I'm I, by the way, I'm gonna go with Team Cisco. Um, because Deep Space Nine is a complicated place. Um, and he is he's he's decisive, he's empathetic, and um just a really interesting dude. It would have been Picard, but I would, but I recently rewatched a bunch of Deep Space Nine. And I was like, oh yeah, he's really good. I, I'll jump in and I'm going to go with Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia. I, I grew up with them. I'm a Star Wars nut. 
um, and between the two of them, you know, not only uh, did they inspire people within Star Wars, but they've inspired generations of uh, young men and young women ever since the 1970s. And, and whilst I don't like what happened to them in the most recent trilogy, um, you know, I think the Skywalker siblings uh, are an inst you know, really inspirational duo in science fiction. I'm going to kind of throw a hand grenade on there, and then unfortunately we're going to have to close. Um, of all the Star Wars movies, my favorite hands down is Rogue One. Um, I can watch that over and over and over again. And I, there's so much lore in there that they just tease about that makes me, infuriates me that I have not been able to get to, into it. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm probably gonna have to go back and, and watch it again today. Um, I cannot thank you all enough for joining us for this conversation. Uh, we literally scratched the surface. I'm keeping a, a kind of running tally of the questions I was able to ask, and we did maybe probably about 5% if that. Um, so with that in mind, I cannot thank you again enough. The book is to boldly go. I have a copy. I believe it's out tomorrow officially. Uh, so if you haven't pre-ordered it, please go pre-order it, pick it up. Uh, the essays in there cover everything from Battlestar Galactica to the Expanse and everything we've discussed thus far and more. Um, I really, really strongly encourage everybody to pick it up. And uh, thank you again. And over to uh, Dan to close out. Joshua, great panel. Thanks for putting this together. Thank you to the panelists. Um, agree with you on Rogue One, Joshua. I think I've told you it's the best Pacific War movie that's uh, never been made, some of those scenes. Uh, and then beyond that, um, you know, the, the tools that science fiction gives us to look at ourselves, uh, look at society. We appreciate your insights on all of that today. Uh, you know, I think uh, we have a whole trilogy of this to go if we reconvene this. So I think just uh, just episode one here uh, and to our panelists and uh, to our audience, uh, live long and prosper. Take care, everyone.